All righty. Again, welcome back to The Morning Report. My name is Willie Lawson. The Morning, the Morning Report is a production of FightBackMedia.com, 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 and FightBackMediaTV.com. We appreciate you being here. Um, I might have mentioned to you guys yesterday, yesterday that um, we had a video taken down off of YouTube um, at like quarter, after, like quarter to 4 p.m. I, I just happened to be working on the channel you know, doing some SEO, doing the best I can to, you know, to, to get people to notice the videos, uh, working outside of and in spite of the, the algorithm of YouTube that is not friendly to us for sure. And when I found out that one of the videos was taken down, I got upset. I was, I, I was, I was really upset and I needed to find out a way after getting the video put, put back up a way that we can make a statement. And it occurs to me, the only way that we, we can make a statement is to be successful. Success is the best revenge. Um, and so I, I, so I thought about how do, can we measure some success on YouTube? And that is with subscribers. Uh, right now we have 467 subscribers. I would like to have a thousand subscribers on YouTube before the end of the calendar year. Uh, December 31st, 2022. Um, that's going to take getting a number of folks um, involved. Now, we're going to have the per day total up on the website, what we need to get there uh, on the website, fightbackmedia.com, fightbackmedia.com, fightbackmedia.com. And um, that's going to be our daily goal. Are we going to hit that daily goal every day? Probably not. Um, but you know what? Without a goal, Things don't get done. And then without deadlines, things don't ever get done. So uh, that, look for that on the fightbackmedia.com website. And uh, we will get that to you today. Today, uh, no doubt. All righty. Let's get started with the program. So what's on the program? What's on the, on the program for this evening? Um, Stacey Abrams. Uh, who lost to Brian Kemp four years ago for the uh, gubernatorial uh, in, a, in the gubernatorial election in Georgia? Uh, Brian Kemp had been the uh, attorney general, and Stacey Abrams was the first black woman uh, who won the nomination uh, for the Georgia top spot in the history of Georgia. So, congratulations to um, Stacey Abrams. Um, Stacey Abrams lost in a very close election and then decided that she didn't lose, that this was stolen from her, that there was election fraud, and on and on and on, which is amazing that she, they just came out and said that there was election fraud and there was, you know, Republicans stole the election from her. Now, those statements were never pushed, YouTube never pushed back on them, Google never pushed back on them. Um, Yahoo never pushed back. None of the major Facebook, um, Instagram, none of the Twitter, um, TikTok, none of the major social media entities pushed back on those statements ever. Although they were say, she was saying the very same thing that Hillary Clinton said. She was, say, she, she, she was saying the very same thing that Donald Trump said. But she was allowed to say it. The video that was taken down and put back up was a video that claimed that I was spreading misinformation about just that. But anyway, Stacey Abrams and uh, and her ilk hit another snag uh, last Friday as U.S. District Judge Steve C. Jones upheld uh, the state's voting law. Remember the state's voting law? Uh, the state's voting law basically tightened up uh, how elections were done in Georgia. And... Um, it was it's, it's very same law that Major League Baseball got it so so wrong in their wokeness uh, that they that they believe the um, the pablum that this was somehow Jim Crow 2.0 and moved their their All Star Baseball game out of Atlanta, Chocolate City, to one of the whitest cities in America, Denver, Colorado. It's it's a head scratcher. It is anyway. Uh, although the Georgia election system is not perfect, 
The challenge practices violate neither the Constitution nor the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the judge said in a 288-page order as highlighted by the Associated Press. Abrams Group, known as Fair Fight Action, brought the lawsuit, which also um, joined um, by was also joined by Care in Action and later by churches. It was originally uh, extremely broad and called for a significant overhaul of Georgia's election system, but by the time it got to trial, the scope had narrowed significantly after some allegations were resolved by changes in the state law and others were dismissed by the court, the AP pointed out about the, the lawsuit's course. The lawsuit was filed nearly four years ago, shortly after Abrams lost to now Governor Brian Kemp in 2018. Uh, he had been serving as Georgia's Secretary of, uh, of State at the time, though the complaint was amended at, to a reflect that the current Secretary of State Brad Raff, Raffensperger in December 2020. This is a voting rights case that resulted in wins and losses for all parties all over the course of the litigation and culminated in what is believed to have been the longest voting rights bench trial in the history of the Northern District of Georgia. The AP also quoted the judge, um, quoted Judge Joseph saying, that same day, um, Kemp from his campaign's account uh, tweeted out an article from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution uh, and celebrated how Stacey Abrams and her organization lost in court on all counts calling out how she would use the lawsuit, the lawsuit. This is what the Kemp said on Twitter. Today, uh, Stacey Abrams and her organization lost in court on all counts. From day one, Abrams has used this lawsuit to line her own pockets, sow distrust in our democratic institutions and build her own celebrity. Not untrue, not untrue. It, they also said that Judge, Judge, Judge Jones's ruling exposes the legal effort for, for what is really is a tool uh, wielded by a politician hoping to wrongfully weaponize the legal system to further her own political goals. In Georgia, it is easy to vote and hard to cheat. And I'm going to continue working to keep it that way. Like in a lot of places, like in a lot of places, uh, we understood that there needed to be some tightening up of voter laws. There needed to be some tightening up of voter laws. Uh, some organizations, government entities would have to start talking to one another. Let me give you, an, let me give you a personal observation. My brother-in-law passed away couple of months ago. His name is still on the voter rolls. He may indeed receive an absentee ballot that his wife, my sister-in-law, could fill out and send it. They've been married a number of years. She could copy his signature and they wouldn't know. It would be awful. It would be illegal. And my, um, my sister-in-law is a woman of God and won't do it. But she could. That's a problem. By the time the, um, the, the general election rolls around, uh, my brother-in-law would have been passed away almost three months. And we're here in Florida. This is a problem. Those agencies need to talk to one another. When a death certificate is, you know, is filed, somehow that person needs to be taken off the voter rolls. Don't you think? And there are all sorts of things going on, you know, unattended uh, drop-off, ballot drop-off boxes. Not a good idea. Now, where I live, and I can just go by where I live, um, there was a drop-off box for uh, for uh, ballots. It was indoors at the um, secretary of uh, secretary of elections, the second the uh, supervisor of elections office. It was actually indoors, and there was somebody watching it. And at night, it was put away. 
having them out on dark, de on, you know, in dark, desolate places in the middle of the night is not a good idea. Now, it doesn't. Now, what I'm saying it doesn't mean that anyone's done anything illegal, but is it a good idea? No. And these laws, a lot of them enacted around the country, address those very same types of things. And why wouldn't you want it to be a uh, thing on the up and up? Why wouldn't you be fighting for more stringent ways to keep it, ways to keep people from cheating? It isn't like Republicans wouldn't cheat. It's too real, right? It is curious, very very curious. Joe Biden compares himself to the devil. Well, that's funny. So do I. I mean, President Joe Biden has been incessantly bringing up abortion in hopes that the issue will save the Democrats from losing their narrow majorities in the House and Senate in the upcoming November midterm elections. On Sunday night, Biden's tactic got even more desperate and weird, bizarre, as he appeared to compare himself to Satan, to Beelzebub. He tweeted this. My dad used to say, Joey, don't compare me to the almighty. Compare me to the alternative. And here's the deal. Democrats want to codify Roe. And Republicans want a national ban on abortion. The choice is clear. Well, yeah, it is clear, isn't it? It's extremely clear. Biden's tweet mentions how his father told him, don't compare me to the, to the almighty, but to the, quote, alternative. Is that the devil? Okay. The opposite, there's no opposite. You know. But the president then goes on a tweet, uh, a seemingly unrelated point, claiming that Democrats want to codify Roe, Republicans want a national ban on abortion. I mean, that the choice is clear. In addition to making a quite odd comparison, Biden isn't even being all that truthful. Uh, the Democrats don't really want to codify Roe v. Wade, but rather expand it through an extremist legislation known as the Women's Health Protection Act. The bill would not only make it make abortion legal up until birth without limit, it would invalidate pro-life laws passed at the state level. Further, the national ban on abortion <clears throat> that uh, Biden is referring to as a 15-week abortion ban with exceptions to reflect the unborn children um, can feel pain at this point. And that particularly brutal method is also more dangerous for women. Senator Lindsey, Senator Lindsey Graham of, of South Carolina introduced legislation last month. And, and, and for us over here, um, Graham shouldn't have done that. The idea that um, the overturning of Roe v. Wade was to send it back to the states, not an opportunity for the federal government to come in and make a law and pull that power away from the states. That should have never happened. It was interesting that Biden, uh, who presents himself as Catholic, has brought up faith in the context of abortion before. I happen to be a practicing Roman Catholic. My church doesn't even make that argument now. Biden claimed um, last month um, the president was referring to the Graham's, Graham's bill. As Sarah has pointed out, Biden lied about the bill's exception as well, in which include rape or incest uh, that the woman receives treatment for and is reported uh, if there is a minor involved. And that is, I mean, that's in, in, in Graham's bill. But that's in a lot of the bills that are in the states. The Catholic Church takes an abundantly clear stance against abortion. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who is similar, pro, uh, who is similarly pro-abortion, has been told by Archbishop Salvador um, Cardellon of San Francisco that she should not present herself for Holy Communion. She hasn't been excommunicated, but they won't they won't serve her in communion. In response to, uh, to, to such a tweet, RNC Director of Faith Communications, Andrew Brennan, told townhall.com that Democrats will lie 
and desperately try to distort their pro-abortion agenda to mislead voters. That is so true. Um, folks aren't buying it. In, thir in 36 days, Americans will vote to reject Democrats' radical, out-of-touch, late-term abortion extremism. I believe that is true. We'll see, but I believe that's true. All right, when you go a little break, we'll be back with more of the, of the program right after these messages. All right, again, welcome back to The Morning Report. My name is William Lawson. The Morning Report is a production of FightBackMedia.com, FightBackMedia.com, and FightBackMediaTV.com. We are thrilled that you can make it today. It is Tuesday, October the 4th. Um, 2022 in the year of our Lord. It's already October. Soon, it, soon it'll be it'll be Halloween, and shortly after that, it'll, it'll be Thanksgiving, and then before you know it, it'll be Christmas time. Christmas time is here. Uh, <laughs> oh wow! It seemed like it was just Christmas time, didn't it? Yeah, but here we go again. Um, now and um, as Christmas approaches, it's time for us to get a. Some rudder pedals from my flight flight simulator. You can't really see it here. You, you, you can hear my desk squeaking and my and my, and my headphones to listen to ATC. But um, I got my can't see it. But my um my throttle quadrant here um, that came with my yoke. Now it's the time for some rudder pedals so I can steer these airplanes. In any case, can't wait. I'm gonna kid at Christmas time. All right, let's get to the last story uh, in today. Let's see here. Hammered by a crime wave. Chicago, the Windy City, faces curbs in pretrial detention. That means they are slowing down on people who get arrested and have to wait in prison until, or in jail until their trial. Even as Chicago struggles through mounting crime, uh, public safety advocates express, expect that worse times are ahead as the state is about to severely curtail the pretrial detention, a policy they worry that will put more criminals on the, on the streets statewide. Already suffering with, a, with the high rates of violent crime for decades, Chicago saw, saw murders skyrocket in 2020 by 55% and rise further into 2021. This year, so far, murders have eased a bit by 16%, but other crimes have shot up. Car theft is up 71%. Other theft is up by 61%. Robbery is up by 17%. And burglary by 25% compared to the same period last year. Um, the city police has been complaining that their efforts to arrest criminals goes, goes wasted because they see them quickly back on the streets. That problem is now poised to become even worse with the state's bail reform provisions coming into effect in January. The reform, uh, part of a large bill called Safe T Act of 2021, uh, primarily denies judges the ability to release defendants on cash bonds. It goes further through several uh, lawyers and law enforcement professionals told the in. NTD Television, a media, uh, the media sister of the Epic Times, uh, the starting in January, defendants would be uh, would only be kept in custody pending trial if their crime they're accused of is specifically listed in the law. Nonviolent offenses and some violent ones don't fall into that category, even for repent uh, for, for repeat offenders. The only crime for prosecutors would have an easy way to keep a suspect detained is when the charges carry life or prison, life in prison sentences, such as murder. Uh, some attempted murders, according to Michael Levinson, criminal defense attorney, practicing in Cook County, uh, which, it, which does include Chicago. No drug offenders, including dealers or manufacturers, would be detainable pretrial, nor would defendants in any cases that where they could potentially only face probation, such as second degree murder, robbery, carjacking, residential burglary, according to Patrick Kennelly, state attorney in McHenry County, who is suing the state uh, government over the law. Even for most crimes where the law would allow detention, prosecutors would have to prove that the person poses a danger to a specific person rather than the community in general, as in the case, as is the case currently. 
Uh, this seems unworkable from a public safety standpoint, said Levinson, noting that it could be often impossible to really prove that. Uh, he gave an example of a serial carjacker. Maybe they're not really a threat to the person they already hijacked, but maybe they're a threat to the next person. And how do we know what next, who the next person is? The requirement also seems unfeasible in courtroom practice, according to Kenlin. Uh, a lot of times the state uh, is being asked to run these hearings and make these uh, offerings uh, to, uh, as proof 24 hours after the defendant's arrest or 24 hours after the crime. We just don't have the time to figure out a specific identical person that they are a danger to. And even if such a person can be identified, the law requires that all other alternatives to detention must be deemed insufficient by the judge, such as alternatives include house arrest or GPS tra tracking with an ankle monitor or checking into drug treatment facilities, uh, among others, which are currently recommended in many cases. The incoming law curbs the punishment for violating those alternative arrangements. The defendant, for example, cuts off the ankle monitor and absconds. The current practice is to issue an arrest warrant, which gets the which is executed by law enforcement to track the person down, or more frequently, um, busting the person uh, during an, a future reoffense or encounter with the law with law enforcement. So if they get in trouble again; they get hit with that charge again. Sounds like it's going to be the wild, wild west in Chicago for a while. Or, or Illinois for a while. So when these people say that they're not soft on crime, they're not, they're soft on criminals. They're allowing these folks to end up back on the streets, which will only make them more bold and thus make them more dangerous. My name is Willie Austin. This has been the Morning Report. The Morning Report is production of fightbackmedia.com, 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 and fightbackmediatv.com. Till we see you again, go out there and learn something, love somebody, and for goodness sakes, take care of yourself. We'll see you when we see you. Bye-bye now.